Of all the many unexplained phenomena and objects in the world, the ones that hold a great deal of fascination for us are what can be categorized as ancient anomalies. These are objects that by scientific measure are very old but in form or construction appear to be quite modern. They are impossible devices, out of time technology, anachronistic artifacts. In other words, if our history of the world is correct, they just should not exist. And there are many examples, many more than geologists, archaeologists and other scientists care to admit. Why are they so fascinating? Because they do exist and do not fit the standard scientific timeline or geologic and anthropologic chronology they suggest in their own baffling way that either our dating techniques are wrong or there is far more to the history of life on this planet than we currently know about. We will look at a variety of out of time technology here ranging in purported origin but all said to show advancement well ahead of their time. The megaliths of Saxai Human have left archaeologists, historians, scientists and scholars puzzled about how these gigantic stone structures were built. Considering how huge these stones are and how perfectly aligned they fit into each other, one is left to marvel at the ingenuity and thinking that went into building this monument. However, the confusion lies in answering the question, how were the ancient Peruvian able to move these stones? How were they able to hew, shape and carve each stone to fit perfectly with every surrounding stone on top, below and beside it? Several postulations have been put forth to explain how this stone citadel was constructed, including the use of juice from a mystery plant that has the property to soften stones. There are others that believe the ancient Peruvians have access to long lost ancient technology that could melt stones. Let's look at what researchers have said about this magnificent structure. According to researchers Christopher Jordan, Jan Peter de Jong and Jesus Gamara, after a careful study of the surface of the granite wall concluded that the stones were glazed. The implication of this is that the stones were subjected to an intense heat of several thousand degrees and allowed to vitrify, making the surfaces glassy and very smooth. To apply heat on a large scale as evidenced with the vitrified walls means some sort of high-tech device was used. Zhang, Jordan and Gamara argued that based on their observations, the ancient Peruvians heated the stones to high temperatures which softened them. Then they shaped and moved it into place with the other stones already in place. These researchers went further to propose that the stone melting technology was widely known and available across ancient civilizations across the globe. They believed that there are evidences of similar technology scattered across the globe to confirm their position. If ancients had a technology that enabled them to soften stones, it would go a long way to explaining the many stone structures scattered across the globe, including the ones found in the Maya, Olmec and Aztec cultures respectively. This may be a far-fetched speculation but consider first the fact that most of the ancient complexes bear strange markings that indicate a form of tooling while the stone was still soft. Keep in mind also that these stones we are talking about are so enormous and heavy that it would be practically impossible to maneuver them into position with our modern machinery. If you are still not convinced that the ancients could have been in possession of some high tech device, consider also that some stones in the ancient Inca constructions have as many as 12 and 13 perfect angles on the visible part of the stone. This also suggests that the stones must have been carved while they were still soft. However, in spite of the researches and studies, we are still not anywhere nearer to understanding how this ancient stony monument was built. Nanotechnology is simply the manipulation of matter in atomic, molecular and supramolecular level. It is a technology design pattern which is capable of manipulating molecules and atoms to fabricate macro scale products. The earliest modern documentation of nanotechnology dates to the late 20th century with the invention of the scanning tunneling microscope in 1981 and the discovery of fullerenes in 1985. One very important question is how long has nanotechnology really been in practice on earth? No one can answer this question precisely 
although two major archaeological discoveries have shown nanotechnology could have been used as far back as the Roman Empire and possibly much further back. The Lycurgus cup is an artifact which hints at an early practice of nanotechnology and dates as far back as the 4th century. As strange as it might sound, it looks like the Roman age people might have been the first known civilization to use nanotechnology. The Lycurgus cup is a cage cup which was acquired by the British Museum in 1958 and is the only surviving complete example of cage cups made from dichroic glass. It responds to light stimuli by changing from opaque green to translucent red. It's believed to contain tiny amounts of colloidal gold and silver which is the source of its rare optical properties. A study by the Department of History and Archaeology at Cardiff University in conjunction with the Department of Conservation, Documentation and Science at the British Museum concluded that the cup and other related vessels are evidence of a long-lived, large-scale production of glass. However, the small number of cage cups and even smaller number of those showing dichroic color changes proves an incredible intricacy was put in effect to create it. It certainly was not mass produced. Only a limited number of Roman period glasses appear to have been colored by gold. However, the colors of other dichroic glasses do not replicate the Lycurgus effect exactly. Another proof of earlier practices of nanotechnology are the microscopic nano spirals found within materials which are believed to date anywhere between 300,000 BC and 100,000 BC. They were discovered at several locations in the Ural Mountains in 1992. Excavated at a depth of 10 to 40 feet, these nano spirals are made of tungsten, while their cores are made of molybdenum or tungsten. The spiral's proportions display a sort of regularity, which is an indication of them being manufactured only by mechanical means. This is proof that they were artificially made and not naturally occurring. While some concluded these nano spirals are mere debris from test rocket launches, a report from Moscow Institute determined that they are older than products of modern manufacturing. In 1996, Dr. E. W. Matveyeva from the Central Scientific Research Department of Geology and Exploitation of Precious Metals in Moscow concluded that although they are thousands of years old, they are products of a technological craftsmanship. How were these tiny components manufactured and for what purpose? While many researchers believe they are evidence of nanotechnology in the past, others still believe that they are extraterrestrial in nature. What do you think? The Lai Zi text is an ancient philosophical volume of stories which is believed by Chinese and Western scholars to have been composed sometime in the 4th century BC. The text contains numerous stories, one of which featuring an astounding account on what may be an ancient engineering marvel, much older than the text itself. The text describes a sort of engineer, an artificer named Yan Shi. Sometime around 1023 to 957 BC, Yan Shi presented a marvelous invention before the fifth king of the Chinese Zhu dynasty, King Mu. Yan Shi had created a life-sized automaton which was able to move and perform several impressive functions. The automation could move in a lifelike manner and could sing. The Lai Zhi text went on to describe the internal workings of the robotic construction which include complete life-size innards such as liver, heart, bones, joints, skin and hair. It's a remarkable feat to think that the ancient Chinese knew thousands of years ago how to construct mechanical and human-like machines. Could it be that our modern technology is just catching up in robotics? There are even more intriguing stories from different sources about ancient Chinese mechanical inventions. One such famous story is about Dai Feng Ma, a skilled designer constructed not only mechanical birds that measured the wind's direction, but also a famous automated device that served as a dresser for the queen. Through ingenious levers and switches, when the queen opened the mirror, the doors beneath automatically opened as well. 
He devised a robotic woman servant for the queen that would bring washing paraphernalia and towels Then the towel was removed from the servants arm it automatically triggered the machine to back away into the closet Over the course of Ma Dai Feng's life he invented several varieties of instruments including mechanically operated utensils an account from stories of government and the people an ancient Chinese book Contains fascinating tales of great mechanical and robotic invention during the Tang Dynasty. King Lan Ling, who ruled during the Northern Qi Dynasty, 550 to 577 AD, was famed to be ingenious with mechanical inventions. According to the book, he once invented a human like robot that could dance. The robot could also serve wine. The story, unfortunately, didn't describe the internal mechanics of the robot. All these remarkable advanced devices force us to reevaluate our current understanding of mechanical engineering in ancient times. For centuries, this encrusted, disintegrated lump of bronze has kept scientists scratching their head, trying to work out the purpose and origin of this strange artifact. More than 2,000 years would pass before a team of divers, who, after spending over a year exploring a shipwreckage in 1907, would bring to the surface tons of artworks a trove of long trailing jewelry pieces and of course this mystery clock-like device they were unable to explain this bizarre piece of technology because it was unlike anything anyone has seen from that era they eventually called it the antikythera mechanism in honor of the small greek island where it was discovered interestingly the antikythera mechanism was so complex that it wasn't until the 14th century during the development of the clock in Europe that something similar in complexity would be seen again In fact according to recent carbon dating this ancient device is even older than was first thought This new information puts the antikythera mechanism even further ahead of its time The x-ray imaging of the 1970s and 1990s enabled researchers to learn about its ability to replicate the motions of the heavens but it wasn't until the development of 3d imaging that researchers were able to say with authority that the invention was an ancient computer-like device used in calculating and teaching the tiny spheres on the front of the device could represent the Sun and several planets and researchers believe the machine was once encased in a vertical cylindrical case with dials and inscriptions on the back and front a hand crank on the side would have allowed a user to turn the gears that would in turn move the dials So that anyone using it could determine with precision the exact position of the Sun and the moon on any given day The mechanism researchers believe could also help users track when a lunar or solar eclipse would occur Hence helping them to prepare for such events since in ancient times these cosmic events had ominous implications some of the inscriptions on the device hinted where it was made researcher Paul Iverson from the University of Western Reserve University of Cleveland published a report that showed the calendar months include month names used in ancient Corinth and the surrounding Northwest towns a dial that tracks major athletic festivals was found to list Na, a Northwest Greece festival and Hylia a festival once held on the island of Rhodes Paul Iverson suggested that maybe the devices were made in Rhodes and was being shipped north Regardless of the speculation surrounding the device one thing everyone can agree on is that the Antikythera mechanism has shown that the ancient Greeks had access to a far more complex technology than anyone believed possible for their era Halsoflieni Hypogeum in Malta is an underground cave supposedly used as a burial site around 3000 BC Made up of three levels its rock cut chambers have corridors and passageways which connect the underground chambers It's regarded as a temple and contains the remains of what looks like an unknown race After many studies were carried out some researchers believe the remains belong to an alien race Others believe they belong to humans with long head skull features Another strange feature of the hypogeum is that it's on three levels with the lowest chambers not discovered until 1902 during excavation by 
Sir Themistocles Zamet. Its top chamber is said to be a large hollow with tombs on its side. The middle level contains intricate wall paintings and carvings. The deepest level, referred to as the lower level, can be accessed down seven steps into the chamber and is called the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies, discovered in 1902 during excavation, is the chamber said to have strange acoustic properties. Also referred to as the Oracle Chamber, the vacuum in there is believed to be capable of amplifying voices and can resonate so strongly that it can be felt throughout the body. This acoustic property of the Halsoflieni Hypogeum has been the subject of various researches. The Journal of Anthropology and Archaeology, Volume 3, 2015, claims Halsoflieni Hypogeum Oracle Room is a center for generating resounding echoes which continue into other parts of the hypogeum with a pinball effect. At the right frequency, not only sound but also duration is amplified. It was even reported that some sounds echoed for as much as 8 seconds after the original sound is stopped. It's found to respond highest to frequencies within a range that can be sung by bass or baritone voice. Kreisberg believes the size of the oracle chamber itself has a magnitude capable of creating the wave guiding effect upon the sound waves produced within it. The end wall of the room has been carved like a projecting ridge and has obviously been created to carry sound waves. Was the hypogeum designed to enhance amplification? If so, why? Is it possible that the designers of these spaces knew something that modern scientists are just discovering? The craftsmen of antiquity thousands of years ago achieved a sophisticated gilding technique that's still unrivaled even up to this day. These incredibly skilled metal workers perfected a method to use mercury, a liquid metal discovered in Turkey 8,000 years ago, to coat different metals such as silver, bronze and so on. Interestingly, this sophisticated coating method was known in other parts of the ancient world as evidenced in the different gilding designs on domes, religious figures, interiors of cathedrals, and more. These ancient gold and silversmiths use a procedure similar to present-day electroplating in addition to mercury amalgam to stick metals onto surfaces. This shows that electroplating was already popular in ancient Babylon and Egypt, thus disproving the popular science that electroplating was discovered in the 1800s in Italy. Over the span of several centuries, the metal workers had discovered an extraordinary range of different techniques to process metals. However, knowledge gaps still exist about how gilders in this ancient period applied lustrous, strikingly even films of silver or gold to delicate objects. It seems that mercury was used as a glue to hold an incredibly thin film of gold or silver on the metals. Intricate jewelries, statues, and other objectives. You may wonder if electroplating requires electricity, how were these ancient smiths able to generate electricity for their work? The concept of electricity is widely associated with Williams Gilbert, who discussed it in 1600. Before then, the only knowledge of electricity available to modern mankind is the electric fish phenomenon. Later in 1748, Benjamin Franklin coined the term battery as an analogy before Alessandro Volta built the first electrochemical battery, called the Voltaic Pile in 1800. However, the discovery of an artifact, referred to as the Baghdad or Parthian Battery, which dates back as far as 150 BC, challenges the concept of Volta being the first inventor of a battery. The Baghdad battery is the first prehistoric example of an electric power source. Found in 1936 by railroad workers in the Tel Kahoot Rabu area of South Baghdad, it's cylindrical in shape with the bottom capped with copper discs and sealed up with bitumen or asphalt. An insulating layer of bitumen was used to seal the tops of the pots and iron rods were suspended into the center of the cylinders. These rods showed strong evidence of corrosion by an already evaporated acid. After this initial discovery, several similar devices were discovered in the basement of Baghdad's museum. These, including the Baghdad battery, 
were concluded to be very much like present-day dry cells. All of them look Parthian in nature, which brings about a huge confusion, as Parthians are widely known for their skills as warriors, not scientists. The big question here is why were they manufactured and how did they function? William F. M. Gray, an engineer at the General Electric High Voltage Laboratory who experimented with the Baghdad Batteries replica made of copper containers filled with grape juice or vinegar and concluded that they are pure evidence of electric batteries in the prehistoric age. These BC vintage batteries are very simple. This sheet copper was soldered onto cylinder less than 4 inches long and about an inch in diameter roughly the size of two flashlight batteries end to end. The solder was a 60-40 tin lead alloy, one of the best in use today, Gray said. His experimentation showed the Baghdad battery was able to produce small current and proves that the practical use of electrical current has been long in existence before being officially invented. Some researchers like Dr. Paul Craddock from the Department of Scientific Research at the British Museum believe the use of the Baghdad purpose was purely for rituals. He proposed it may have been placed in a metal statue. Worshippers would have felt a tingling sensation when they touched the statue similar to electric shock. They would have thought this to be evidence of magic, power and mystique. This theory however has no evidence backing it up since no metal statue has been found with a cell hidden inside. One popularly accepted theory is that the current produced by these mini batteries was used for electroplating metals. This is highly supported by Harry M. Schwab in his article published in 1957 in Science Digest, where he claimed Baghdad silversmiths were gold plating jewelry using electric batteries. Another researcher, Kaiser, thinks the needle like rods found inside the batteries might have been acupuncture needles from China with the device being used to purify them. Maybe they were invented to serve as a source of electricity like those found in electric fishes that were used by ancient cultures like the Greeks and Romans for medicinal purpose. Irrespective of what the real means and purpose of the Baghdad battery and other similar devices is, it's proven that electric batteries have been in practical use for thousands of years. Thus, our ancestors were way more advanced than we think. Prehistoric builders from ancient empires, Egyptian, Mayan, Greeks, Indians and Chinese, used stone, the most robust surfacing material on the planet, to drill perfectly round holes. Now, in our present world, with all the machinery and technologies, we have taken this feat for granted. However, this is an astonishing achievement for our ancestors. These perfectly round drilled holes indicate the ancients were familiar with highly advanced technologies. It is evident that these large sized holes found in ancient stone required some level of sophistication, engineering skills and adequate cutting equipment to pull off. We don't think the people of the time possessed this technology, but now there are several pieces of evidence pointing to the contrary. And what's even more profound is that the rock hard stones of all kinds were used, including granite, basalt, and diorite. If the ancient builders were not limited by the hardest stones, it's fair to speculate that they had advanced technology. Take, for instance, ancient Egypt. The builders of the Great Pyramid hollowed out the sarcophagus in the king's chamber using a tube drill. We can still see the tube marks in places where they drilled, though obviously the builders tried to cover up the marks with extra polishing. You can imagine just how surprised the first archaeologists would be stumbling into these ancient technological marvels. The tubular drill varies in thickness and size, ranging from a quarter inch to five inches in diameter. Abu Sir and Abu Ghraib are two other famous places in Egypt with remarkable drilled holes. In 1996, a fragment of drilled hole from this location was put on display by the Cairo Museum. A closer look showed the unmistakable spiral grooves of a drill. What's also fascinating is that stone cutting is a widespread ancient practice found in every part of the earth. 
Another place with a visible ancient hole cutting technology aside from Egypt is the island of Sumatra in Indonesia known as Swarnadwi Pa an island of gold in Sanskrit This mysterious and ancient stone cutting tradition is also evident in West Cornwall where one can see the men on tal stone of the hole so far mainstream scholars have been unable to answer how these curious drill holes were made what their purpose was and what type of tools were used but regardless of whether we can answer these questions the evidence for advanced technology is cut in stone shreds of evidence suggest that the antediluvians were familiar with metallurgical technologies like ours and in some cases they had access to knowledge which we haven't even begun to dream of our ancestors it seemed were in possession of extremely advanced metalwork knowledge including highly sophisticated hardening techniques and technologies to handle casting of large pieces and interestingly this knowledge was not confined to one location the ancient Chinese and Indians were at the forefront of antediluvian metallurgical advancement China had a long history of almost 3,000 years of metalwork they were in fact the first civilization to manufacture cast iron they truly achieved a skill level in cast iron works that seems almost unbelievable one of such impressive ancient Chinese metalwork is the iron cast pagoda made entirely from the top down of cast iron one can see this gigantic metalwork still standing proudly in the Dangyang Hubei province of China forged in 1061 the iron cast pagoda is 197 meters tall with 13 stories of built-up octagonal shaped cast iron sections that are joined together by a tenon and mortise knot system another famed Chinese cast iron structure is the legendary iron lion manufactured in 953 AD and is situated not far from the Grand Canal at Zhangzhou in Hebei province this substantial iron cast lion weighs over 37 tons with a hollow center and its walls vary in thickness from 40 to 20 centimeters crested on its back is a lotus pedestal of cast iron that weighs about five tons ancient Indians are famous for the ability to cast iron structures capable of withstanding corrosion this according to sample analysis is attributed to the high phosphorus content of the iron produced during that era a glaring example of how adept these Indian Smiths were in metal processing is the majestic column of cast iron located at the courtyard of Kutub Minar in Delhi India standing at 23 feet and weighs approximately six tons scholars have placed the probable manufacture date of this iron cast column to over 2,000 years ago which means that the ancient Indians were already familiar with metalworks before the Europeans along the length of the column is an ancient Sanskrit language inscription which points to the original location of the column in the temple of Mutra and on top of the iron cast structure sits Garuda messenger of the gods the bird represents a reincarnated image of the god Vishnu the Indian god known as the preserver however legend has it that the invading Muslims destroyed the Garuda tore the column from its first home and moved it to present location in Delhi in the 11th century there have been several attempts to explain how this large column was manipulated during the construction also the question of how it survives the harsh winter condition for several centuries is something that still defies an answer and to think that this is not the only iron cast work by the ancient Indians only goes to demonstrate that these people have mastered the art of metal manipulation more than we could imagine sadly though this knowledge was lost thousands of years ago before the advent of the compass and the modern navigation systems as we know them today the ancient Vikings had already mastered the art of open sea navigation how did these men of antiquity sail thousands of miles on open seas without getting lost in the sea what navigational tools did they use in their seafaring journeys how is it even possible that they could make these daring sea explorations the answer to these questions lies in the short passage from the Norse sagas the weather was very cloudy it was snowing 
Holy Olaf, the king, sent out somebody to look around, but there was no clear point in the sky. Then he asked Sigurd to tell him where the sun was. After Sigurd complied, he grabbed a sunstone, looked at the sky, and saw from where the light came, from which he guessed the position of the invisible sun. It turned out that Sigurd was right. The problem, however, was that scholars dismissed the sunstone mentioned in the Norse sagas either as myth or a magical device that never existed. Fortunately, following a recent discovery by archaeologists, they discovered a special crystal that many believe pointed to the existence of the legendary Viking sunstones. The crystal was dug up in a 1592 sunken Elizabethan Viking shipwreck near the Channel Islands. Researchers from the University of Rennes said the stone was found among a pair of navigation dividers, which strongly suggests that it may have been kept among the ship's other navigational tools. Though there's no record that the Tudor sailors used the sunstone like their Viking forebears during navigation. However, the researchers suggest that they may have used the sunstone in the same way as the Vikings, especially during overcast days, or when the sun is down, to avoid the magnetic interference that's often the case when a compass is used. To use the sunstone, the ancient Vikings would, on a bright sunny day, calibrate the sunstone by holding it out in the sun until the sun rays polarize and get split into ordinary and extraordinary rays of beams. They would then rotate the sunstone until the pair of beams aligns. This enables them to mark the true bearing of the sun, hence be able to navigate the seas even when the sun is down or during overcast days. Then there's the Unar talk a navigational tool that could also show us how the Vikings were able to navigate the seas thousands of years ago. The round-shaped device is estimated to be 7 centimeters in diameter and when taken together with the sunstone acts as a sort of compass. So the finding from a shipwreck has finally brought to end the debate whether the sunstone existed or not. Today we know it really did exist and it played a crucial role in the Viking seafaring explorations. The existence of inexplicable monuments, certain man-made marvels, and archaeological finds pertaining to our ancient and prehistory are leading more and more archaeologists to believe long-forgotten advanced civilizations existed and passed down its knowledge to other less advanced civilizations after a major cataclysm. There are dozens and dozens of examples of unexplained technology and artifacts enough to give the traditional scientific disciplines a shakeup. But because they don't fit conventional theories, these exceptions to the rules are almost always rejected out of hand. Yet it doesn't take dozens and dozens of exceptions to challenge established thinking. All it takes is one thoroughly examined, completely verifiable anomaly to say, the world isn't quite what we think it is. Thanks for watching. Leave a like and hit the bell button to stay notified of the very latest documentaries.